The Bridges of Madison County. The last dregs of the book, unfortunately. Pages 163 to... Ah, I had it. 171. Alrighty. Postscript, The Tacoma Nighthawk. As I wrote the story of Robert Kincaid and Francesca Johnson, I became more and more intrigued with Kincaid and how little any of us knew about him and his life. Only a few weeks before the book went to the printers, I flew to Seattle and tried again to uncover additional information about him. I had an idea that since he liked music and was an artist himself, there might have been someone in the music and art culture of the Puget Sound area who knew him. The arts editor of the Seattle Times was helpful. Though he did not know of Kincaid, he provided me access to pertinent sections of the newspaper from 1975 through 1982, the period in which I was most interested. Working through the 1980 editions, I came across a photo of a black jazz musician, a tenor saxophone player named John Nighthawk Cummings, and beside the photo was the credit line Robert Kincaid. The local musicians' union provided me with Cummings' address, advising me that he had not played actively for some years. The address was on a side street near an industrial section of Tacoma, just off Highway 5 running down from Seattle. It took several visits to his apartment before I found him at home. He was wary, initially, of my inquiries, but I convinced him I had a serious and benign interest in Kincaid, and he became cordial and opened after that. What follows is a slightly edited transcript of my interview with Cummings, who was 70 at the time. I, at the time I talked with him. I simply turned on my tape recorder and let him tell me about Robert Kincaid. Interview with Nighthawk Cummings. I was doing a gig at Shorty's up in Seattle where I was living at the time, and I needed a good black and white glossy of myself for publicity. The bass player told me there was a guy living out on one of the islands who did some good work. He didn't have a phone, so I sent him a postcard. He came by, a real strange looking old dude in jeans and boots and orange suspenders takes out these old beat-up cameras that didn't even look like they'd work. And I thought, uh-oh. He put me up against a light-colored wall with my horn and told me to play and keep on playing. So I played. For the first three minutes or so, the guy just stood there and looked at me real hard, with the coolest blue eyes you've ever seen. After a little while, he starts taking pictures. Then he asks if I'll play Autumn Leaves, and I do that. I play the tune for maybe 10 minutes straight while he keeps on banging away with his cameras, taking one shot after another. Then he says, fine, I've got it. I'll have them for you tomorrow. Next day, he brings them by, and I'm knocked over. I've had a lot of pictures taken of me, but these were the best by far. He charged me $50, which seemed pretty cheap to me. He thanks me, leaves, and on his way out asks where I'm playing, so I tell him shorties. A few nights later, I, took out, I look out at the audience and see him sitting at a table off in the corner, listening real hard. Well, he started coming in once a week, always on a Tuesday, always drank beer, but not much of it. I sometimes went over on breaks and talked with him for a few minutes. He was quiet, didn't say a lot, but real pleasant always asked politely if I'd mind playing Autumn Leaves. After a while, we got to know each other a little. I used to like to go down to the harbor and watch the water and ships. Turns out, so did he. So we got to the point we'd sit on a bench for a whole afternoon and just talk. A couple of, just a couple of old guys winding it down, starting to feel a little irrelevant, a little obsolete. Used to bring his dog alone. Nice dog. Called him Highway. He understood music. Jazz musicians understand it, too. That's probably why we got along. You're playing some tune you've played a thousand times before, 
and suddenly there's a whole new set of ideas coming straight out of your horn without ever going through your conscious mind. He said photography and life in general were a lot like that. Then he added, so is making love to a woman you love. He was working on something where he was trying to convert music into visual images. He said to me, John, you know that riff you always, you almost always play in the fourth measure of Sophisticated Lady? Well, I think I've got that on film the other morning. The light came across the water just right, and a blue heron kind of looped through my viewfinder. All at the same time, I could actually see your riff while I was hearing it and hit the shutter. He spent all his time on the music into images thing, was obsessed by it. Don't know how he made a living. He never said much about his own life. I knew he traveled a lot doing photography, but not much more until day one day. I asked him about the little silver thing he had on a chain around his neck. Up close, I could see the name Francesca on it. So I asked him, anything special about that? He didn't say anything for a while. Just stared out at the, rip at the water. Then he said, how much time do you have? Well, it was a Monday, my night off, so I told him I had as much as it took. He started talking. It was like a faucet got turned on. Talked all afternoon and most of the night. I had the feeling he'd kept this all inside of him for a long time. Never mentioned the woman's last name. Never said where it all took place. But man, this Robert Kincaid was a poet when he talked about her. She must have been really something. One incredible lady. Started quoting from a piece he'd written for her. Something about Dimension Z, as I recall. I remember thinking it sounded like one of Ornette Coleman's free-form improvisations. And man, he cried while he talked. He cried big tears. The kinds it takes an old man to cry. The kind it takes a sax saxophone to play. Afterward, I understood why he always requested autumn leaves. And man, I started to love this guy. Anyone who can feel that way about a woman is worth loving himself. So I got to thinking about it about the power of this thing he, he and the woman had, about what he called the old ways. And I said to myself, I've got to play that power, that love affair, make those old ways come out of my horn. There was something so damn lyrical about it. So I wrote this tune. It took me three months. I wanted to keep it simple, elegant. Complex things are easy to do. Simplicity's the real challenge. I worked on it every day until I began to get it right. Then I worked on it some more and wrote out some lead sheets for the piano and bass. Finally, one night I played it. He was out there in the audience, Tuesday night as usual. Anyway, it's a slow night, maybe 20 people in the place. Nobody's paying much attention to the group. He's sitting there, quietly listening hard like he always did, and I say over the microphone, I'm going to play a tune I wrote for a friend of mine. It's called Francesca. I watched him when I said it. He was staring at his bottle of beer, but when I said Francesca, he slowly looked up at me, brushed back his long gray hair with both hands, lit a camel, and those blue eyes came right at me. I made that horn sound like it never had before. I made it cry for all the miles and years that separated them. There was a little melodic figure in the first measure that sort of pronounced her name, Francesca. When I finished, he stood real straight by his table, smiled and nodded, paid his bill and left. After that, I always played it when he came by. He framed a photograph of an old covered bridge and gave it to me for writing the song. It's hanging right over there. Never told me where he took it. But it says Roseman Bridge, right below his signature. One Tuesday night, seven, maybe eight years ago, he doesn't show. He's not there the next week either. I think maybe he's sick or something. I start to worry. Go down to the harbor. Ask around. Nobody knows nothing about him. Finally, I take a boat over to the island where he lived. It was an old cabin, shack, really, down by the water. While I'm poking around, a neighbor comes over and asks what I'm doing. So I tell him. Neighbor says he died about ten days ago. 
Man, I hurt when I heard that. Still do. I liked that guy a lot. There was something about that cat. Something. I had the feeling there was things he knew that the rest of us don't. I asked his neighbor about the dog. He doesn't know. Said he didn't know Kincaid either. So I called the pound, and sure enough, they've got old highway down there. I go down and get him out, and gave him to my nephew. The last I saw of him, he and the kid were having a love affair. I felt good about that. Anyway, that's about it. Not long after I found out what happened to Kincaid, my left arm started going numb when I play for more than 20 minutes. Something to do with a vertebrae problem. So I don't work anymore. But man, I'm haunted by that story he told me about him and the woman. So every Tuesday night, I get out my horn and I play that tune I wrote for him. I play it here all by myself. And for some reason, I always look at that picture he gave me while I play it. Something about it. Don't know what it is, but I can't take my eyes off that picture when I play the tune. I just stand there, about twilight, making that old horn weep. And I play that tune for a man named Robert Kincaid and a woman he called Francesca. Thank you very much for listening to the Bridges of Madison County reading. And if you would, please like and share these videos to help us grow. Get the word out there. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.